I'm Luciana Souza, I'm a Brazilian jazz singer and songwriter, and I'm an NEC alum. Hi, I'm Stephanie Borgani. I'm a first year master's student in the jazz department here studying voice. I mean, I love when I'm with students and I hear new voices, new, you know, musicians, and, and new songs. A lot of the pieces were original pieces at mm -hmm. the master class, mm -hmm. and that was really interesting to me, uh, to see what kinds of things are coming out of younger people. That's one of the things that I love uh, when I do master classes. It's really sort of what's new, and, mm -hmm. and then to be able to hopefully, in a very short amount of time, see, sort of do a little diagnosing and see what's going on and see how you can actually serve and help them yeah. with something that's concrete. Like if I do something technical, I want it to be immediate for them to be able to feel and then the audience also to be able to, the people who are there, to be able to see that it can be done. I mean, not because I'm magic, but because the person actually went mm -hmm. through the process and did the thing that they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I think we had a little bit of, you know, some things that were technical for yeah. the vocalists, some things that were more about the ensemble a little bit more, like in the piece that uh, the Brazilian piece yeah. that you guys performed at the end. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard to pinpoint individual things, but I think the ensemble, um, I, yeah. I was able to at least feel something about that and, and try to help yeah. in that way. It's so great to find teachers who, who know how to do that, like see, see music and pick exactly what needs to be done to make it better overall, and it's, I think it's nice that you do that. Yeah, it's, it, takes, it takes a while. I remember my I'm first sure. master class. I mean, I, I went to a lot of great master classes mm -hmm. when I was in school, and I still do as a, you know, as a grown uh, artist. I still take a lot of lessons. So I see great teachers, and I just steal from them. So mm -hmm. I think I, a lot of what I do is what I've seen other people do as well. And hopefully I can pass the, you know, the same information. But I think you have to try to do it. And it's a nice thing to do it. I always have my students, when I do recitals, uh, try to do constructive criticism, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of notice good things in what I talked yesterday about the Panini technique, you know, for everything yes. that you have to say something that needs help, you have to be able to find two good things to support it. Otherwise, it's just too hard. We all have things that are wrong that we need to improve. Yeah, that was, that was nice. Did you, did you always um, think that you'd be doing this kind of teaching as a part of your career? Like you, you said, you travel a lot doing master classes and things like that. Um, I didn't, I love teaching. When I went to Berkeley, um, the first work study job I had was tutoring ear training. So I was mm -hmm. already, I saw the value in that because one of the things that teaching gives you is it forces you into being honest. One cannot teach from a place of fear because if you do, you fall apart. Mm -hmm. And it's so clear to the students that you're not being honest and you're not being authentic and you really don't know. So when you don't know, you better say, I don't know, and let's go together and find out or go look for help yourself and then come back and present it to the students. So I love that it keeps me connected with a place of honesty and research and constant growth for myself. Um, I didn't think I was going to be teaching all over the world. I mean, I literally go to Spain mm -hmm. and I teach twice a, a year in Basel in Switzerland now and I go oh. to Berkeley regularly, maybe twice a year and do mm -hmm. things there. Um, it may change, but that's what's been happening in the last maybe three or four years. Oh. Um, and uh, I'd still love to, I mean, Sometimes when I think about a place like NEC or Berkeley, um, as much as I loved my experience in both places, um, I sometimes find that it's not for everyone. So when people come to me as a private student or they see me after a concert, they say, do you think I should go to school, to music school? Mm. Sometimes I say, what else is going on in your life? And could you get the same things that you would get from school without having to go to school? What, what school is great for, for me, and it was for me, and I think it's great for a lot of people, is that you're connected to a group of people who are like-minded and who are willing to risk. The problem with not being in school is that you don't get a lot of chances to do recitals and sing with people and fail and, yeah. and, and try and get up and fail better and fail more times, but with a support system. Uh, when you get out of school, you have to do this in front of a paying audience, and that, that is hard. And also connecting with friends and developing a group of peers who you're going to you know, get out of school and move to New York or do whatever, you know, follow your path, whatever that may be. You, you'll have these people that you have something in common with. That was very important for me. When I moved out of Berkeley, uh, people like Donnie McCaslin, who teaches mm -hmm. here now at NEC, and Danilo, who has taught here, Danilo Perez, and now teaches, has his own institute at Berkeley. We all went to Berkeley at the same time. And then when we left, you know, we went to different places. I moved back to Brazil, Danilo stayed in Boston, and Donnie moved to New York. And, and then years later, we find ourselves, like, today in the same city, and, you know, for a minute. Yeah. 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 
I think what's interesting about that is that you as a vocalist did participate in a lot of people's other a lot of other people's projects as a side person and sometimes that doesn't happen so much as an experience you can get to learn the trade and, and get inserted into the market. Um, thinking from a career perspective, a lot of people are like with this perspective that you're in school learning to be a side person, learning to go out and play in other person's projects. And then sometimes as a singer, there's so much focus on being the band leader. Right. Um, but I like some of the stuff that you've done with Danny McCaslin, for example, and Maria Schneider. It's, it's great. Um, how did you sort of approach that and develop that part of well, very early on, you know, I come from a family of musicians. Very early on, I was involved. My parents had a, worked at a jingle house, so I was always singing backgrounds and jingles, commercials for TV and radio, never with my face, but just my mm -hmm. sound, my voice. So I, I grew up doing a lot of that, and that experience taught me immediately that I needed to hang with musicians, not just singers. Mm -hmm. Because the singers were great and quick learners, but the musicians were the one instantly coming in and doing three, four jingles a day, reading things very fast, creating different vibes and grooves and atmospheres, and, you know, the job when you do jingles, it's very, very fast. You go from studio to studio to studio at that time. Nowadays, I'm sure it's different, but this is, you know, centuries ago when, when that kind of stuff happened. And so this sort of seed was planted in my head that I wanted to hang with musicians, but yet I wasn't a musician. I was a singer. And I also very early realized that there was a beauty in that, that what I was going to express was going to be different, but I wanted to hang with musicians. So I literally attached myself to people like Danilo and Donnie when I was at school follow them around. Mm -hmm. I think I was a bit of a groupie to some, <laughs> and, uh, but it was a musical thing. And mm -hmm. I think everybody also felt that. And I also had a degree in jazz composition. That's what I decided to do, not performance. I knew I was going to sing, and that was going to be in my, you know, how I would express my music. But composition was really the thing that I knew. I, I felt that if I had those tools, then I could express better. I learned to read, which was something I did not know before I went to school at all. I had, I had no formal musical training, just ear training a lot. And so with those skills, when, whenever I could insert myself in a band or write something for someone, I would do that. So I, I was pretty it was pretty clear to me. So I kind of followed that. And, um, and then I said yes to everything. And anybody would say, do you want to come in and just double the, the oh. horn or double the oh. Sure, I'll do it. You know? And that sort of started a thing. But I, I really believe that that aspect of my career has fed everything about my music, mm. has taught me so much. Being in a studio, not having to be the leader, watching how people do things, you know, being in, it, it's always going to school for me. Every time I, I do it, it's still the same. It's, I learn so much and I'm just so grateful for that. Um, it makes me a better leader. So when I go into my music, I'm richer, yeah. you know, with all those experiences. Do you think nowadays that's something people are becoming more open to, having a voice doubling a horn part, like the possibility of that? I think so, and I, I, I'm sorry to say, but I believe I'm kind of responsible for that. I mean, some yeah, of what I've done, yeah, you know, so. when, 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 when you get to be 50 or you turn 50, which I have done a few years ago, you kind of start looking back and seeing if there was something that I could have contributed to, that I wanted to have contributed, have I done? And I think I at least, again, planted a seed or started something. And I feel very proud of that, and I continue to tell my students to to work on that. So a lot of what I do with students is work on them being leaders, but also being good side people. And that may mean playing percussion, playing clave on somebody's band. It doesn't really necessarily mean, you know, and I did a lot of that too. And also be willing to not sing. So I go and I do projects with people where they say, I want you to sing two songs and be, you know, do these four nights at this club with me. Uh -huh. Can you just come and do that? And of course I can. You know, it, it saves my voice. I still get to shine, and you know, I mean, I get all my ego gets fed, but I, and I contribute to the music. More importantly, what I think is that when you add a human voice to an ensemble, what you're really adding is the humanity, it's the fragility, is the the vulnerability that the human sound brings. So if they're looking for that on those two pieces, I'm happy to give, and be quiet for the rest of the concert and mm -hmm. just sit at a corner and enjoy myself and listen, yeah. which is one of the things I love to do about music anyway. That's yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I'm so influenced by what you've done, and that's sort of what I'd like to do more of. Um, and I'm starting to do it here at NEC, and it's, it's great. Um, I'm happy for you. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful, you know. How has your career changed? Because I think some, some of the stuff that I've listened to the most of yours is your earlier albums, like the Brazilian duos. And now the stuff you do now is so different from that. How has, how has that arc happened over the years? I don't know. I don't, I don't spend too much time listening. I mean, I still sing some of my older repertoire, especially when I go to schools and people want to do some of my older things. Um, I don't 
I, I didn't, when I was younger and did my earlier records, I didn't set out to do, I'm going to do three records of Brazilian duos, and then this and this and this would happen. The first duo record that I did was my dad was diagnosed with cancer, and I mm. needed to record with him, so I did a couple of duo sessions with him. Then I was like, oh, maybe I should complete this record. He was no longer able to play well enough for his own, you know, approval. So then I contacted a, a player that I used to play with, Romero, and then Marco, and then I finished that record, put that out. It went viral at the mm -hmm. time, which was not viral for what it is now, but let's say it, it put me on the map. And, um, and then a few years later, I wanted to do a second one, and then a third one, and then I said, that's enough of that, because I could do that forever with my eyes closed, you know, and I love those projects. Um, and so I, I think the path that I've had in my life, I mean, I haven't planned. I don't have five-year plans or 10-year plans. I have mm -hmm. dreams and people that I want to connect with and people that I want to play with or projects that I may want to do but I don't know when they're gonna happen or if they're ever gonna happen. So I just keep these dreams floating, you know, in my head and my dome here. And then um, the music has to change. I mean, you can't, I mean, aspects of what I do are still the same. I'm still learning to breathe and sing in tune and express and connect with musicians and interact and listen. But, you know, I'm more interested in poetry now than I've ever been. I was very much into wordless music and, you know, instrumental music, I was really, crazy about that. So I got my fix on that. I fed myself with that. And, and now it's been word, words have been the dominating thing in my life. And I, mm -hmm. I love that. And, and sometimes it's a mixture of both. And sometimes it's working with other people. This year I primarily have done side projects. Um, I, I put out a record last year, but this year I've toured with the Yellow Jackets. I've done three orchestral pieces. I've recorded on two records where I just sang, sang lines and things for other people. Um, and I've done a ton of teaching, and that's been really good. Um, and I don't know, next year's looking different. And uh, I have a record coming out with a big band in Germany with Vince Mendoza, and uh, so we're planning on touring that summer and fall. So, you know, it keeps shifting. I don't have a lot of control mm -hmm. over how two years from now or three years from now I can aim for, for things, but then life happens in between. And I just have to take it, you know, and also I have a family, I have a child, and so that occupies a great deal of my time. And, and then I'm also active in doing other things. I mean, I volunteer in different places and, mm. you know, in, in council and I'm on a couple of, um, I'm curating a couple of projects in LA. And so I have a, a very rich life and busy life. So music is very, very important, but it's not the only thing. Although it, you know, it, it generates a lot of happiness for me. I take a lot of happiness from other places and, and family life also. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned music and volunteering. Um, as an artist, what do you think of the role of music today in a world that's so divided? Music for me has always been a companion and, and almost a need, like my best friend. Um, you know, there's no place I'm happier, really. I mean, I'm very happy in family and with friends, and, but music feeds a part of me that nothing else feeds, at least not that way. It's something I can do alone and I can be in all kinds of moods and it's still you know, it's very, very personal to me. I'm lucky that I love what I do and I get to do what I do and, and survive and make a living with it. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond what I feel about music, I feel, I, I think right now, and the, the way the world is, um, the intolerance, the, I mean, I want to say hatred, the division, and not just in the country, but all over the world. I see it in Brazil, where I'm from, and where you're from. I see it in places like Venezuela. I see it in all over Europe, in different countries. I see it in China, I see it all over the place. Um, we have worked very little in feeding our soul what our soul needs as, as a civilization uh, and feeding our planet what the planet needs. And I think we're in a very, very difficult crossroads where there are wars going on beyond wars, which, ha which have been very difficult times. If you think of the first, the Great War and, you know, Second World War, World War you just, um, I just think that we've missed the boat on, on taking care of ourselves. And one of the things that I think music and the arts do, and I think everybody agrees if you, if you have you know, a bit of brain in, your <laughs> in there, is that we know that, it, um, that the arts will, will tap into something inside that will bring tolerance and equality. And I mean, all these beautiful concepts that we know will, will bring survival to us. I think we are at a point right now where we are really looking at extinction. I mean, from a point of view of climate change and where the planet is. And it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to face. I think we're all, in some ways, we know it's there, and, but we're kind of ignoring and just 
going through and I'm driving my car that's moved by gas still. I mean, you know, we're trying to make changes. All of us, no straws, no, you know, plastic bags, but we need to make bigger changes. And one of the changes that I'd like to see is bring back music education and arts mm. into schools. I mean, that, that's a big fight we have in L.A. And, um, and, uh, and I think music is one of the things that's this, this language that, that goes beyond borders and, and really connects people in a way that very few other things do. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy that you and I and people in this building, we are all working towards that in, in, in sometimes in, in, in invisible ways and in quiet ways, um, but we are contributing to something that's, that's bigger, hopefully. Oh, but you, you were talking about borders and... Um, I'm curious, actually, how, how it's been for you to have a career that's based in the U.S. as someone who's from Brazil, um, who has played Brazilian music, but also has this strong jazz background. Like, how do you sort of bridge those things? Um, one of the, the gifts of being Brazilian is that we're born in a country that has so much music. It's mm. just a gift. I mean, I, every day I thank the gods that I was born there and given this thing, you know. I was also lucky that I had come from a family of musicians, but... Um, uh, I, I never forget that I'm Brazilian. I mean, I carry it with me with a great deal of pride and also joy. I mean, it's just this thing. I mean, I have that passport, you know. I can just <laughs> tap into that music and I feel so connected to it. But I also knew that I couldn't, I couldn't really have the career that I wanted to have and the freedom I wanted to have musically in Brazil because I'm the daughter of who I am and the goddaughter mm-hmm. of who I am. I mean, I have just the strange pedigree when it comes to that in my generation, you know. My parents had a recording studio and had a record label that put out 50 records in the, in the 80s. And it was all Brazilian instrumental music. It was called Sonda Genchi. And in it was my godfather, is my godfather, the great Hermeto Pascual. So I was blessed with these things, but it's also a charge that you carry with you when you're, you know, and in order to become someone else, I needed to leave. It was very mm-hmm. clear to me that I couldn't be under the wings of, you know, and sort of w- what was happening there for me. And it was... In Brazil, you have a couple of choices. You can become a pop singer, which means you're huge and you play the mega places, or you can be a a real outsider. And I didn't want to lock myself into these two options only. And I wanted the freedom that jazz brings, which is this music that embraces all these different influences and where you can actually still make a contribution. I feel like in classical music, I mean, if you are lucky enough to be given a chance as a composer, it's still pretty narrow and pretty, even though there's an excitement about new music now, um, it's, it, it's, it feels like the, the walls are closer together. And jazz has this openness and unfinished thing that I love. It's always sort of you know, eating itself and reinventing itself and incorporating all these new things. So I felt like I needed to be a jazz singer, whatever that meant. And for a moment, it meant being like Ella Fitzgerald. shoo doo you do do Like, you know, that's what I wanted to do. So I had to come to a place like Berkeley and learn that I wasn't that. Mm. And it was really through composition that I found my voice. And I always encourage my students also to write. Whether it's good or bad, it really doesn't matter. The, it's the exercise of writing and applying your knowledge that you have in theory, harmony, your training, your own intuition, putting it, committing it to something that's going to take you forward and help you create your own voice, whether it's a voice as a singer or a voice as an artist. And I always try to explain to students that you are a saxophone player, but you're an artist. So you you have to think bigger than just playing this instrument and mastering this thing. You're here. If you're going to be here for the duration, you're a part of this music and you have a responsibility to this music, which is to keep breaking new ground, doing new things, and leaving something good for those who are going to come later. I'm in my 50s now, so one of the jobs I feel I have is to lift people up. So when I hear somebody great, when I'm a part of, uh, you know, some kind of jury or committee that's going to grant money to things or, you know, which happens more and more as you age, (laughs) which is kind of nice and also not nice. If I'm not connected to anybody or know anybody in the competition or something, I, if I know someone, I have to excuse myself, but if I don't, I, I, one of the things I love is lifting people up the same way that others lifted me up. And so I feel this responsibility now. And, and it's one of the good things about aging is that you care less and also you care more about the right things. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of stuff did you write and do right now as a composer? Um, I transcribe a lot. And, and a lot of what I try to write, like if I 
if I find myself stuck writing the same kinds of things, because you know I have a claw on the piano and I play, it's like it's the same kinds of voice, it's the same kinds of sounds. When I find myself in that, stuck in things like that, I take a lesson. Mm -hmm. And inevitably when I take a lesson, like a piano lesson or a composition lesson, people usually say to me, go listen to this. And this, this thing that they send me listening to is something I have not heard or I should be because I haven't explored that thing. So I go and transcribe. So a lot of what I write and what I'm doing right now is sort of transcribing things that I don't know about. So I love the word Stravinsky and some of the stuff that I know about Stravinsky, but I don't know Stravinsky. Because when I was in school, it was something I needed to pass an exam, so I heard some Stravinsky just so I would know what it was there, you know, to be able to identify and pass the hit music history test. But, so right now I'm listening to things that, I'm listening to Arvo Part and trying to, because I'm, I'm interested maybe in the future writing some choral music. Um, I've done small things in the past. I wrote for San Francisco Girls Chorus. I wrote a piece for them based on a, a, poet, a poem of Gary Snyder. Um, and I've written things for a small vocal group. I had a vocal group with a bunch of um, great, great singers, Theo Blackman and Kate McGarry, and, uh, called Moss. And I wrote for that group, and I, I love that. But I want to write a large orchestral piece, and long piece. And that, that will take me, what, 10 years or something. But, so I'm listening to to choral music now, and especially to Arvo Part, I love his music. It's just brilliant and so different than anything that I've ever dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a piano teacher who said, you should, if you're interested in that, you should listen to that. So I go to people who will poke me and provoke me, and that's one of the things that I, I tell students also. I gave a master class yesterday, and the student said, how do you motivate yourself? How do you? I don't. I mean, I'm not you know, a genius or brilliant or anything like where I have this wheel turning inside and, oh, go, go, go. So when I find myself also slowing down or going backwards a little bit, um, I go to someone who can poke me. I'm, ha I'm lucky that I live with a man who's brilliant and, you know, he's my husband. <laughs> and, uh, and he's always reading and he's omnivorous about things and, and ideas. And, and so I, I get to see someone who's like that, who's always interested and curious about things. And so I, I can see that in someone else and that inspires me too. But when I get stuck, I go to people who can push me. And so I, I encourage everyone to do that because, you know, at my age, you can also sit back and just say, hmm, it's great, feels great. I'm Luciana Sosa. You know, like you can kind of fall into this idea that y you are somewhere where you should stay. And again, when you said about, you know, what I said about writing earlier, you know, you, I, I can't do another record like that. So I have to keep, I mean, still similar. I'm still myself, but keep pushing forward. So take lessons, <laughs> even when you're out of school.